I think like as some of the space that I've been kind of like working on in the last few years is more looking at issues of infrastructure resilience and sustainable development broadly defined. Uh, very quickly, I, I'm sure like we have seen global climate change uh, models. I mean, global climate change, some of the work that I've done in the last 10 years is working with global circulation model, global simulation models uh, that can simulate like what would be the different scenarios of atmosphere under different uh, kind of like uh, greenhouse gas emission trajectories. So this is from the IPCC report, for example, where um, you know, like the, these models require massive amount of data sets um, and they, they can simulate four dimensional planetary system over hundreds and mil uh, millions of years, depending on the model scope and so forth. Uh, but they can also be used for decision making. Um, and that's where like the United Nations, for example, Conference of Parties meetings are, uh, this model is uh, like uh, a, a simulated version of a large, more complex model. Uh, this is from the climate interactive, like John Stillman's uh, place in MIT. They run this uh, mm. for more, making this uh, interactive for the negotiators to use this model actually like in during the negotiations on the go. So I just wanted to show this as an example, like how models can be used as to see and support systems by uh, like, I think this particular model is used by uh, representatives in from more than 30 countries uh, during the negotiations. You can go to their website and download the model, it's open source. Um, so, I mean, that's kind of like a, a one way that we can use uh, computer simulation models for decision making um, and kind of like projecting the uncertainty and kind of like looking at how different interventions can kind of like have an impact. Um, I've also been looking at some of these uh, uh, more like regional scale integrated assessment models that can integrate more global climate change models with agent-based models and hydrodynamic models and lake models um, in more like complex, uh, um, NSF has invested millions of dollars in this model in the last few years. I've been uh, fortunate to lead this project um, and we have kind of like uh, come up with very specific, uh, uh, very context specific uh, decision support tool for uh, the towns and the regional planning commission, as well as the, the state government, the EPA officials to utilize and understand like how um, impacts of climate change uh, are gonna affect at like spatially distributed manner. Uh, so this is a downscale climate change scenario on a random day in 2040. Um, and this is like an agent-based model that can simulate the evolution of land use in, in an entire watershed. Um, and this is the hydrological model that's connected. And this is the lake model where like, this is the red color shows the algal blooms that can emerge because of the increasing temperature and nutrient fluxes in that system. So this model can simulate on a daily time scale, uh, like uh, the, the evolution of the lake system, the hydrology, depending, depending on the condition of the land use and the climate change. And the decision makers can use this model to understand like, what are the management implications of uh, like doing X versus Y. So I just wanted to start with this because I think these are um, like some of the uh, technologies that are overlooked in our kind of like discussion about AI and big data, like how they can help government, but people kind of like get into the frenzy of Cambridge Analytica, but ignore these uh, kind of like uh, longstanding approaches that have been at the core of decision making and have taken up in the government. And we've been working with the government agencies at many levels. This is just one example. There are many, many examples. I've seen like over the years of Axel present so many models. And so it's, a, it's just like an entire uh, growing area, like both in the agent-based modeling, in the network analysis, and kind of like uh, um, other kinds of uh, integrated assessment models and so forth. Um, also, um, like, I mean, so I'm just gonna skip this. These are like some of our forecasts. Um, I know Brad is gonna talk about it a little bit, but I just wanted to set the stage. Um, I mean, this, some of the slides are, but, the autonomous vehicles, for example. Autonomous vehicles is another disruptive technology um, that as I was talking about earlier on, like uh, can have a lot of benefit for an, like an aging society. Um, you know, as the baby boomers are retiring, we need, um, and older people don't wanna give away their car keys. They just wanna keep on driving. But I think the autonomous vehicles can provide a way to reduce the accidents. I mean, that's been demonstrated. But at the same time, autonomous vehicles can also be fooled like if, if somebody replaces the stop sign and changes just slightly, the, the sensors that are on the system can be fooled in, through kind of like a strategic manipulation or the onboard computer system can be hacked if, if it's not cyber secure. So I mean, all of those kind of uh, like risks are there as well as there are potential benefits. So how do you go about weighing um, the, 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 the pros and cons of these autonomous vehicles? Um, also, like drones, like uh, drone warfare, uh, you know, like I come from Pakistan, we have seen uh, U.S. drone warfare in Afghanistan tribal region 
um, like that was a pilot test ground there, um, but it's also been used drones in other places, but there is no international drone treaty at this point of time. Um, but the question is like, say, if, if other people start using drones on the US land, or like already Heathrow Airport has uh, drone intrusions and other airports are getting intrusions just from the hobbyists, but it could also be strategic warfare. So what is the global international treaty for drones look like? So these are some of the issues in terms of autonomous vehicles that we need to think about. Um, but drones are also being used in precision agriculture. They're also being used for mapping uh, like at very high level LIDAR technology. So there's a lot of potential, but at the same time, there's a lot of risk. Um, and I think uh, quickly um, in terms of the workforce development, I sent you a report. I just wanted to highlight that came from the IBM Center for Government uh, just last month. Um, and kind of like, uh, I know that uh, them have a lot more to say about it, but just wanted to highlight their key findings that in terms of the workforce development, I mean, this does not even include uh, government accountability of this, which I'm sure like uh, you will hear a lot how they are using the data sets. But I think the uh, Department of Treasury, I mean, these are the numbers, the number of people affected by uh, the AI technology. But I think uh, as we heard earlier on, like uh, it's been known since the days of Herbert Simon. I mean, those of you might have read Sciences of the Artificial, uh, that kind of like started this discussion, like how the workforce development would evolve in response to these artificial intelligence technologies. And he kind of like puzzled with the idea of like routine versus non-routine um, and uh, like what is programmatic, programmable versus non-programmable uh, tasks that would need to be accomplished. And um, can AI start doing non-programmable uh, tasks and like for in terms of like strategic development and versus the routine tasks uh, already are being done by many like AI -like <laughs> apps and so forth in the e-governance arena. So a lot of this discussion is like how the workforce, what is the future of the workforce, um, given that AI technologies can be used to augment the policy makers and the CM makers, or they could also be used to kind of like mislead them. So because they are, hackers can get into this. So, so these are all the issues that we have to think about. Um, then there was this report that Kevin De Souza wrote, he's in Australia right now for the IBM uh, Center, and kind of like he gave an overview um, this is my like last set of slides before I hand over to Paul. Like, um, I mean, he kind of like provided a nice uh, overview. It's like a couple of years old, um, but he kind of like talked about the IT infrastructure, like for, you might've heard about the debates of 5G now these days, like uh, how the Chinese are kind of like gaining uh, some kind of competitive advantage over US in terms of like these fast infrastructure. Um, like if you happen to be in Korea, I mean, South Korea, you would see like their internet speeds are already way faster than what we have here. Uh, so the IT infrastructure, the legacy is a challenge. I mean, we, how do you replace that? Um, and in, especially in places like Vermont, where I come from, there was a recent study that was done. About 80% of the rural areas are not, the, the IT companies say that they, are, they have the coverage there, but actually they don't. So when you have like AT&T and Verizon, you don't get access. Um, and many people, so there is a question like internet has and the internet not has, or digital has and digital not has, because the problem is that if you don't have access to internet service, how would you access or utilize in an inter interactive with these technologies? Uh, so there are a lot of other kind of like more specific challenges in terms of like interoperability and project man management capabilities. So there is a lot of opportunity um, because of these challenges, we can take a lot of action to improve that infrastructure in a nutshell. Um, but that would require investment and resources. Um, similarly, in the workforce development I already alluded to, um, I think that uh, government needs to there needs to be some kind of reform package uh, to think about like how government training of the MPAs or training of the uh, in the work, the workforce people who are actually in the government uh, and needs to be enabled to kind of like we, we can't wait uh, for for these technologies to go back because I think if you look at the, the report that just came out um, last month um, the, a lot of the older people are going to be the ones that would be affected. Uh, like if you look at this distribution of the age, uh, like the people who would be affected according to this analysis. Um, so we can't wait these people to retire and then train the new workforce development. I think there needs to be some kind of like a, um, some kind of uh, an infusion of AI and big data training in the existing workforce if we want to overcome this challenge. So I, how do we go about doing that? I think this is a, this is a question that's critical for ASPA and NASPA. That's kind of like part of this uh, discussion. Uh, so I think I will wrap it up by just uh, my final comment here is about some of these issues in terms of 
cybersecurity, like how do you, the risk management, I mean, so there are risks and benefits, but how do you manage the risks that these technologies pose? Um, and clearly, I mean, uh, I think Kevin D'Souza like nailed it in, in the sense that with cybersecurity, we need to have that capacity. Um, but cybersecurity is becoming more and more complex with new technologies like quantum computing or quantum cryptography can like overcome some of these other technologies. And I sent you an article to trust the AI or robots that came out in Scientific American as, as preparation for this. Um, and these are issues that, you know, like even established programs cannot handle these kind of like uh, technologies. So where we are going with that. Um, and then um, issues of like ethical and social consideration and governance of these technologies, I'll hand over Paul to take it away. I mean, he's gonna 